Hello, and welcome to the Zuckerman Museum of Art's last Wednesday lunch program for the month of June. My name is Emily Knight, and I'm the Museum Services Coordinator here at the ZMA. And I'm excited to share with you this month's featured artist, Jess Jones. Jess Jones is a textile artist and associate professor of textiles at Georgia State University, located in Atlanta, Georgia, as well as affiliate faculty in the Institute of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Her work examines psychogeography, textiles' relationship to an urban environment, and the creation of digitally derived, stitched, and layered compositions. Jess Jones' work, Weeping Quilt, which you can see behind me, is on view now at the Zuckerman Museum of Art through July 17th, 2021. Please stop by the main museum and experience this captivating work in person. And we hope you enjoy this month's featured presentation with Jess Jones. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Emily. And um, I have had an amazing time working with the ZMA for this project. And I wanna talk about sort of three big projects um, that I'm working on right now. And the first is um, the piece that's installed at the ZMA that's up until, I think you said, July 17th? July 17th, yeah. 17th. Okay, and that's still on view. And it's about um, processing grief and catharsis and, um, and it's also about quilting and making. And this project was so accidentally um, perfectly timed for this last year of our lives. Mm -hmm. And um, the second um, sort of body of work I'm gonna show is um, stuff I've shown recently at the ZMA that deals with quilting and mapping. And uh, some of those pieces you're probably familiar with. And the third project that I'll show is an ongoing project that deals with mapping and textile history and the city of Atlanta. And I wanted to show it because it really did start with Georgia State students um, asking me one of those good questions that students ask teachers and then you have to like figure it out. Um, so it was really, it was really great. And so I think it just sort of um, circles back really nicely um, with those three projects. So. Um, what you're seeing is the piece Weeping Quilt that I have installed at the ZMA. And this piece is made from like thousands and thousands of little fabric yo-yos. And a fabric yo-yo is this like circle of fabric that's stitched around the perimeter and then it's gathered and cinched. It's essentially the structure of a shower curtain. <laughs> I mean, a shower cap, shower cap, right? And like, if you squish it, it makes this little disc. And um, this is a a type of quilting that started in right around the 1920s. And traditionally this is made into like these grids um, and it's made into bedspread and other sort of home decorations. Um, but what I'm doing a little differently is that I'm stitching these together and grouping them in color and then I'm grouping those colors in different values. Um, so this is how this piece started. And I didn't, I think one of the questions was on the process of the piece, like it was yes. sketching. One of, yes, one of our community members was curious if you did any sketches or thumbnail drawings to envision the composition of these works before you started. Yeah, so like the, the composition, like I, I think I probably did. <laughs> In the early stages, I think I sort of mapped it out because that's how I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I kind of have to draw to, to think, but at some point, like the material takes over and you just have to sort of respond to the material. And um, this is my cat, Lucio, helping me do that. He has a very different response to the material. Um, everything is a toy. And this is how um, I ended up working on these. I just accumulated so many of these. And as I was you know, pinning them into place and revising how I was pinning those things, I used a black and white filter on a camera in order to um, to figure that out. And I, I don't think I'm the only artist that, that does this, right? Like um, old school artists would turn binoculars around to sort of make the work distant to kind of see, um, you know, when, when you have a large scale piece and especially if you're working on it in a small space. So I had to transfer these pieces outside and back inside and, and stuff like that to sort of try and get a sense of what it looked like in the space because it's literally bigger than the space I work in. 
Um, yeah, it's crazy. So this is the um, installation and I ended up wanting to um, make it respond to the window and to have it, you know, the lighter end at the window and sort of and, and fade through. Wow. So in addition to like hanging strands, like the sort of strands of a weeping willow tree, I'm calling these weeping quilts because the project started with this big bag of yo-yos that I received at my grandmother's funeral. And my aunt had, had saved them for me. And sometimes you don't see your family until weddings and funerals. And so she had set these aside to bring to me and I had no idea what to do with them. But I started making more of them for some reason and I don't know why. And then other people started to give them to me and I was like this magnet for yo-yos. Um, I, I found them online, people would sell them. Um, I found them in thrift stores, so I would buy them there. And one thing that became really clear this past year, and this is the reason for the title, um, is that I realized I am not alone in how I process grief. I have to sort of obsessively work at something um, in order to sort of process it. And um, it made me think differently about that original gift from my aunt, right? Like, is this also how someone else processes what they go through? And one of the things that was really interesting is an online seller of yo-yos was getting rid of her yo-yo stash because um, she had made them when she was in the hospital and really ill. And as she recovered, she like made these things and then afterwards did not have a use for them or didn't feel like finishing the project. They'd sort of served, the making of it had sort of served its purpose, which I thought was so interesting. So I was thinking of all the projects that we did um, to cope over the last year, like um, as we sort of grieved for so many people and, um, and for our own sort of daily isolation and I thought about um, how everybody was sort of suddenly taking up gardening, which I did, and s baking sourdough, which I actually made deep <laughs> pizza. <laughs> um, and so for me, this began to symbolize this huge transition. So like this big sort of transition in color and value, like, you know, I don't know, for me, it just sort of symbolized the past year. So um, this idea of, um, quilting and the sort of meaning of that and meaning through making comes up in this other project that I have, um, which is topo quilts that I exhibited at the ZMA recently. Um, and thrifting is dangerous, right? Like she who dies with the most fabric wins is a common saying among quilters. Right? <laughs> and so I will find people's unfinished craft projects or unfinished quilts with surprising frequency. And so I can't just leave them there, you know, like I feel like I have to like, you know, help this person with follow through, right? Like I have my own unfinished projects, but for some reason, maybe the projects of other people bother me more when they're unfinished. There's such um, a, such a role of collaboration in, in the series <laughs> yeah. and in this series as well. It's, it's I love that part. And I, I like to, one of the things I'll show you is how I sort of read quilts. Um, so I have some that I think I, I can tell you about the artist or author behind them, um, which is kind of cool. Um, but so these pieces start with quilt tops. And on the right is the original quilt top that I found in a thrift store. And I am putting the batting and backing onto the quilt top, which is sort of unfinished, sort of main design, the front of the quilt. And I'm also adding this black silk and I am using a projector to project a specific location of Atlanta. And then I'm stitching on either side of those lines and cutting away. So the black silk is what's what I'm putting on the top and the bright color that's revealed is the original quilt. So here's a detail of that piece. And so you can kind of see this, this sort of um, layers going on with that material. And I have a theory though, um, as to why so many of these pieces are discarded. And I'm a person who I've, I've moved a lot and I've moved by myself a lot. And that's one way to realize how much stuff you really have <laughs> and what's important becomes really key, you know, especially when you, when you are moving all of your own things. 
And um, one of the things I haven't moved for myself is unfinished projects. And I have a tendency to donate those really quickly. Um, that sort of dead weight of, of unfinished, plus the sort of way that they kind of glare at you is, you know, they tell you that you failed by not finishing certain things. Um, and the idea of like letting things go or cleaning things out or spring cleaning, um, not moving with certain things is why I think these pieces, these original quilt tops may have been abandoned not far from where they were made. And so, I kind of speculate, it's not, you know, it's not guaranteed, but it's not unlikely that these pieces were made like in the Atlanta landscape. And I share that landscape with people that make these works. And I'm sort of hopefully kind of calling back out to that original quilter. I also think that that for me kind of represents um, a shift in Atlanta itself, the way that Atlanta has a tendency to include some people and exclude others and displace people. And I think that it also sort of speaks to that. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces, Mechanicsville, and it's made from shirt sleeves and pant legs, which I think is really fascinating. You can tell exactly like not just the material, but like the what was the original shape of the material, how it was worn. And this piece I love, it's, um, it was made by someone who is absolutely a dressmaker. And you could tell the level of skill that someone had when they were piecing these things together was not something untrained. And so I, I thought it was really remarkable. And it's a different design sense with this piece. So I thought it was really interesting to be able to sort of tell something about the maker, um, seeing enough of these and having enough experience with quilts. Um, but I think this is probably one of my favorite projects that I've done. And it's not something that I make, except I guess I make a map of these locations. Um, this is called the Lost Weavings of Atlanta, Mapping Works, Remnants, and Removals. And it's essentially a map of places in the city where textiles has been removed. And as it turns out, Atlanta and the textile movement sort of got really big at the same time, right? Like, so in the seventies, you know, Atlanta is getting its first international direct flights. Like, you know, it's, it's becoming a really aspirational um, city and the fiber art movement is right there. And you have these skyscrapers going up and fiber artists were often commissioned for these skyscrapers. And I have a, a class that I teach and we look at 19th, 20th and 21st century textile art. Um, and students were asking me, how come I can't see textile art locally? So I started asking textile artists in Atlanta, like, where have you seen something that, you know, was should have been in the history books? And they had so much feedback <laughs> of where things were. And it was really remarkable. So there's at least a dozen on my list um, that are really, really notable. I focused on six. And this is one. This is um, on the right. I mean, uh, on the left, you can see the um, original Marriott Marquis Atrium. And the piece is a woven piece by Daniel Griffin, who was here from France. And on the right, you can see the current space. Same thing with the Westin, um, the, which was originally called Peachtree Plaza Hotel. On the left, you can see the Olga de Amaral is um, the weaving that she did is on the sort of concrete column that's in the middle of uh, the space, but on the far left side of the photo. And you can see how it's been replaced by a mural on the right side. That's the current Western Lobby. But I've also found both of these in films. Oh, wow. So this is, I think, actually the only good way to see um, the Daniel Griffin piece, which has disappeared, 
is in the, like, I think it's like two or three seconds in the movie Manhunter, only the, the director's cut. <laughs> and it shows up and it's so gorgeous. And it's, you know, it's just this gorgeous moment with this like sexy lens flare, you know, at the bottom. I mean, it's just really nice. And it, the way it behaves in the ambient, um, the ambient drafts is just really amazing. Um, and one thing that was really interesting uh, is documenting the changing local attitudes towards textile art. So um, Daniel Grafan, when he was dating the artist Sheila Hicks, they were here in Atlanta together, checking out different buildings they could put their work in. And the AJC was really open to asking them about their work and what they're like and, you know, what's what's it like to live in Paris? And, you know, it, it was really it was just so open. And when the piece was removed in 2007, AJC had a terrible disparaging article about um, the Daniel Griffin piece. Also, they called it a Christo. <laughs> they, they said it was made by Christo, which is really hilarious um, and sad. But it just is interesting the way that textiles have been sort of continually kind of erased. Um, this piece, the Olga de Amaral piece, you can see it on the left. It shows up in an Italian horror movie, which I love Italian horror, um, although this is not one of my favorites. Um, it shows up for a brief moment and you can sort of see the uh, interior and how it worked in the interior. And this piece was broken into many, many pieces. And then um, there were two that were at the American Cancer Society and I watched them take those down, but they're safe. They're still in the Portman archive. So it, it's really been interesting to sort of have this scavenger hunt and to show students like um, the way that textiles sort of um, becomes really popular and then it disappears. And how does it, you know, it's an interesting question to ask about textile longevity. One of the concerns with the weeping quilt was issues of light and light damage and things like that. So that's something that textile artists have always had to battle with. Yeah. Are you finding this source material? Are you just watching these movies and coming across? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, this one was a chance um, encounter. Like it's documented that that certain buildings are in certain films. And so sometimes I'll start there. Um, but I this one was totally just because I like the genre. <laughs> it's really weird when like your interest in Italian, vintage Italian horror and your interest in textiles can like can intersect. That was a really surprising moment. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And not just with amazing costumes, you know. Are you meeting with people uh, who work in these buildings? How are you going about Absolutely. it? So this project has connected me to architects and interior designers and urban planners and mm -hmm. other researchers. And it's, and actually um, there's an artist who has her work in 191 Peachtree who's Helena Hernmark and she called me up the other day because she knew I was working on this project and she has a studio assistant that is uh, tasked with maintaining sort of the whereabouts of her work and figuring out like who's writing about her and like what's you know like collecting all that information which is so key to surviving as an artist and preserving that kind of history often the artists that I show in my history of textile classes are not ones that show up in art history classes. I don't think I saw, I think that it's a lot better now and there's a lot more uh, inclusivity with different media, but I don't think I ever saw a textile artist um, in art history, very rarely. It was Miriam Shapiro, um, but people, you know, this is another example. This is another Olga de Amaral in the King building that was removed. And it, I mean, it's just stunningly beautiful. She was known for doing these bright, gorgeous gold pieces. They're just so, so stunning. But yeah, I, I really, really like this project just because it, it shows like, you know, how important it is for artists to sort of um, maintain records and, um, and for people to be aware of what's, what's out there with the field. Have you been able to locate any of these works or are they all 
misplaced. Yes. So like there's some that are held privately, right? There's, uh, there's some, actually, I think one of the best examples is the Portman archive is amazing. It's probably one of the best places in town to see textiles because of the records of, um, textile artists, samples and works and stuff like that. So they have the Olga de Amaral pieces from the, um, Weston. Um, yeah, it's, it's been really interesting. This piece has disappeared, but you know, the Helena Hernmark is still around. So it's still, it's the one left standing (laughs) though in 191 Peachtree. Yeah. It's just so interesting to see so much weaving and tapestry in Atlanta, not knowing that it was ever there, you know? Yeah, I just think it's a really interesting, um, it became a project that that became really important to the students and being able to show them sort of in real time, like how, you know, things can disappear. What an amazing project that came about from student questions, I mean. Yeah, and the, and the importance of preserving a medium, right? Like to preserve like textile history. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty important to do that. Do you have any long-term goals with this research project or hoping to expand? So one thing Helena Hernmark said that I really think is great is like, it's fine that you have a map of Atlanta, but like, you know, here's, here's all the cities where my work has been, (laughs) you know, it was in Houston when Houston was, you know, exploding and in population and, and, you know, my work is in all of these cities that that are very similar to Atlanta have the same sort of things. Um, it's really interesting that this could be a, a much larger map. That sounds like a great <laughs> project for the future. I see some <laughs> special topics classes with you, Jess. Yeah, <laughs> multi city. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, and how cool would that to, to have like a interactive map that could be visited and shared. So that's one of the things that I'm working on. Currently, I do have like a a Google site with like um, the pictures and stuff of like the map itself. Mm -hmm. And I've been wanting to like make that into like a website where people can contribute, like Mm -hmm. if they have their own photos, if they have like information about the pieces where they might be things they may have heard, who saw it last, you know. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your projects. Thank you, Emily. This has been really fun. Oh, we've so, so enjoyed it. <laughs> and I, I will show you one last piece because quilters make everything from scraps, right? Like, mm-hmm. and when you make things, you just generate all this other scrap, right? So mm-hmm. here's, I, I made like, three more yo-yo pieces. They're not as big, but like, I just, I'm still covered in yo-yos. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So there's like yet another piece um, from the series. Do you think you'll continue to work with these yo-yo weeping? You know, at some point this, I'll be I'll be real done with this and the (laughs) remainder of the yo-yos as with most of my projects will end up at the scrap bin at Georgia state. And then they end up in student projects and I just, you know, circle of life. (laughs) Yeah. That's wonderful to see. And it's so a part of your work anyways. I mean, you find other works and literally imbue the landscape of the city with them and, and finish them. So that's beautiful. There's something about that idea of finishing and unfinishing and, and that sense is never like, like when is something finished mm-hmm. is one of the weirdest questions that <laughs> I feel like I could ask myself, like, how do I know something is done? You know, like when is the last yo-yo in place? You know? <laughs> I have no idea. So yeah, it's like when does this stop? Like when when does an obsession stop? Right? Like <laughs> so, do you have any, I mean, I guess have you gotten tired of or are you getting uh tired of doing your topo cult series? Is there or is that, you know, never something you're gonna I have a stack of new ones, like ready, like they just need the binding on them. Oh, like it's 
I, I feel like all of these projects that I have, they, I'll advance one and then I'll have to work on another and then I'll advance that one and I'll have to work on another one. And so it's, this has been sort of a three ring circus, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Going on all at once. Yeah. (laughs) Well, is there any upcoming other shows? The the Weeping Quilt Yo-Yos will be on view at the ZMA through July 17th. So definitely come and see it if you have not already. Um, but is there anywhere else we can see your work on view anytime soon? Um, I'm not doing any shows in person currently. Most things that I'm doing are sort of online and I may, I'll send you some links, but, um, but I, I'm sort of taking a break right now, but (laughs) I have a multitude of things I need to finish (laughs) and get put out there. Like I'm at that weird stage where it's like, okay, this is, this has got to get, taken care of you know (laughs) yeah no that's totally understandable and the you know the lost weavings there's not a a good place to sort of display that that ends up being like a a a lecture and a body of research that um comes up uh and I just continually add to it um but it's rare that I get to share it so I'm just really glad that that I got to show it to you today Oh, such a, such a wonderful and important project. Thank you so much for including that in your presentation today. Yeah, thanks.